Hello, this is Tommy Franks. Welcome to the Four Star Leadership Podcast, a product of the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum. We're here to get a view into the lives of the legacy makers, the movers and the shakers of today, to offer insights from the full spectrum of the leadership community. We'll talk to former Four Star students and explore their leadership development path. We'll work to find out what they are about today and learn from the opportunities they've made for themselves in this world. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this podcast. Remember, leaders are not born, they're developed. Hello, and welcome to the Core Principles of Leadership with General Tommy Franks. I am your host, Delise Travis. We're on episode number 26 with our guest, Mo Anderson, CEO, Keller Williams Realty. Mo will share how her foundation and experiences inspired her to achieve greatness. Her seven pillars from her book, A Joy-Filled Life, Lessons from a Tenant Farmer's Daughter, inspired her to achieve all that she dreamed of and more. An unending drive led her to greatness in real estate as CEO of Keller Williams. High standards, integrity, and philanthropy were her underlying foundation. Join us as she shares her inspirational story and encourages us to follow our dreams. Before we get into our program, we'll have a word from our major sponsor, REI Oklahoma. REI Oklahoma is proud to be a part of the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute in the production and distribution of these podcasts designed to inspire leaders and difference makers. At REI Oklahoma, we have been working with small business leaders, entrepreneurs, and people who are driven to succeed for years. Highly motivated people working to own their own businesses, live in their own homes, and make the world a better place. Since its beginning, REI Oklahoma has continued to identify hurdles and deliver holistic solutions to create job growth and help neighborhoods thrive in both rural and urban communities. REI Oklahoma looks forward to visiting with you about helping your business and community grow. Visit reiok.org or call 800-658-2888. Two, three, to start the conversation. The Labar family is a fourth generation Oklahoma family. That may not sound like a long time, but our grandfathers were born here, within the Comanche Nation, before the land runs. We are the proudest sponsor of the Tommy Franks Four Star Leadership Podcast. We hope listeners will heed the words of these distinguished men and women who have served our country at the highest levels and across all walks of life. Mo Anderson joined Keller Williams Realty as president and CEO in 1995. She shepherded the company from 35 market centers to more than 530 within 10 years. Her personal integrity, high standards, compassion, and an ending drive are touchstones that have made Keller Williams Realty one of the most successful franchises in real estate history. Known as the Velvet Hammer for her uncompromising values and standards, her astute business acumen and leadership abilities are uniquely matched by her faith and compassion. Mo has been recognized for her contribution to her industry and to the community on many occasions, such as America's Top 25 Influential Thought Leaders by Realtor Magazine, Real Estate's Most Influential People, inducted into the prestigious Hall of Leaders by the CRB Council, and featured in the Swain Poll Trends Report as one of the most influential women who have shattered the real estate management glass ceiling, just to name a few. She addressed MBA students at the Yale School of Management on two different occasions and has toured North America speaking about her book in a presentation called Seven Pillars of a Joy-Filled Life, which encapsulates the lessons she learned over her lifetime. In every way, she is committed to her belief the higher purpose of business is to give, care, and share. And now let's join Mo. Welcome, Mo Anderson. We are so excited to have you on our program today. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for asking me. We have been so looking forward to this opportunity and so 
appreciative that you would set aside some time to visit with us and share your story with our leaders. So what where we like to start, Mo, is, and you have the most inspiring story, is from the very beginning about who you are, where you started out life, and how you got to where you are today. And we'll, then we'll talk about some of our, our leadership principles, but I feel like those principles begin at the very beginning for you. And I loved your book, and I would love for you to share your story. Well, the book is still available on Amazon if, <laughs> if anyone is interested in it. It's called A Joy-Filled Life. Uh, I was born in 1937 on a farm near Ames, Oklahoma. I was the daughter of a sharecropper. My parents came out of the Great Depression, and they had me in the latter part of the Depression, depression in 37, and it was at the time of the... Uh, it was at the time of the Dust Bowl, so I was born in the Great De at the end of the Great Depression and and during the Dust Bowl. So you can imagine how my parents clawed and scraped and worked day and night to put food in our mouth and shoes on our feet. I was what you called Oklahoma poor, but. We didn't ever have a mattress on the top of our car. <laughs> uh, those early years were very tough for my family. I was the youngest of five. But an experience happened when I was probably six or seven that was what I call a significant experience, one of those experiences that can determine the future of your life. We were in Enid, Oklahoma. We lived 21 miles away from Enid, Oklahoma, and only went to Enid when we had the money to buy feed for the livestock. But, of course, I was excited to go because my father let me choose the feed sacks because those sacks would become my clothing. My mother was a wonderful seamstress. And in those days, they tried to make decent-looking fabric from the sacks because it was during the war and World War II, and they did everything they could so that you could use anything, especially feed sacks for clothing. You have no idea how I longed to have a dress made of store-bought material. <laughs> I have heard um, those stories of sugar sack underwear. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And so we were in Enid, we picked out the feed, and then my father took me by the Carnegie Library. And he came around to open the door, walked me up the steps of that beautiful old building, which has since been torn down because of the asbestos inside. But, oh, it was lovely. And he told me the story of Andrew Carnegie, how he was born in poverty, made his money in steel, how he was a controversial person in those early days, but he was so successful, and his desire was to give away all of his money before he died. Of course, he took care of his family first, and then the $350 million that he had left, which would be equivalent to approximately um, $3 billion today. Uh, my, how our money has devalued <laughs> from yes, the early days. He wanted to give that all away before he died. He was elderly, he was ill, and he knew that he couldn't take it with him. 
So he devised a plan to install libraries in some of the smaller cities in America and in some of the smaller villages and hamlets, so to speak. He paid for the building to be built. He paid for the books. His money paid for the staff for the first year, and then at the end of a period of time, I believe it was a year, then the library was turned over to the city, and it became property of the city. At the end of this wonderful story about a man who understood that the higher purpose of business is to give, share, and care, my father looked at me as a child and said, I always want you to respect the wealthy because the wealthy usually, not always, but they usually give back. Look what this man did, Carnegie, Mr. Carnegie. And that day was a significant day in my life because in that moment, as a child, I understood from my father that it was okay to make money. It was okay to respect the wealthy and that if I ever had wealth, I got it clearly, the message that I should think about giving it away. And Mo, that is a story in your book. Thank you so much for sharing that. That is a story in your book that resounds with me as well, that your parents, being two people of very meager, as you said, Oklahoma poor, means had the vision and the understanding that that could occur and should occur. To me, that was tremendous vision that he instilled in you at that time. Well, it showed that he didn't have prejudice against the wealthy. It showed that he respected the wealthy and what Carnegie did in Enid, Oklahoma, because we couldn't afford to buy books, but we could check them out from the library. He appreciated what Mr. Carnegie did. There's not the, the, the respect and the appreciation for wealth in our country today as there was back then. I agree. I, I, that's why, to me, I think it was so important what he shared with you and how it resonated with you and how it made a huge effect later in your life, especially as far as um, our General Frank's Leadership Institute and how much we appreciate uh, how you give back to our program for developing young leaders. Um, <clears throat> going forward, I know that your mother also encouraged you to be a leader in school during your time in uh, grade school, middle school, and high school. That was an interesting experience. I came home from school one day on the bus, and she uh, greeted me with a piece of homemade lemon pie. So I knew she had a message for me <laughs> because I was always rewarded for good grades with food because that's the <laughs> about the only thing she could give me. She was a great cook. And we lived on a farm where we grew most, most of our food, or almost all of our food. And I also had that little surprise before uh, a little sermonette that she was going to give me. <laughs> <laughs> and so that particular day, she said, I want you to serve on every committee that you can serve on. And I said, why? And she said, because it will give you a chance to practice your leadership skills. She went on to say, I believe you have some innate, God-given leadership ability, and you need to practice it. 
And by being on a committee, it gives you a chance to practice those skills. But more than that, I want you to attempt to be the chairman of the committee because that's when you can really, really demonstrate leadership and people will come to respect you as the leader. And if you do this in grade school, junior high, and high school, when you graduate from high school, you'll be way ahead of the pack because you've been consistent in attempting to practice those skills all the way through school. Well, I, look what that, how that paid off. <laughs> it's just an amazing, amazing story. So motivational and so inspiring. So fast forward, you graduated from high school and you um, went to college. Well, we don't want to leave Richard out. He was there too. <laughs> Well, he was my high school mm -hmm. sweetheart. So he went to the University of Oklahoma uh, because he was offered a full-ride basketball scholarship. And then I went to what was called back then Oklahoma College for Women, located in Chickasha, Oklahoma. It's now called USAO. Uh, and it's a liberal arts college in Chickasha, but it was a women's college when I attended. Let me back up and tell you why I went to Chickasha, because it was a major, major tipping point in my life. Probably one of the greatest things that ever happened to me is when I was a junior in Wacoma, Oklahoma High School, the Women's Study Club of that community chose me to go to Girls State. It was held in Chickasha. <laughs> I see. Uh, the, um, the junior counselor of my town when I arrived at Girls State was a woman named Kathy Black. She was a freshman at Oklahoma College for Women. While at Girls State, I was elected Secretary of State. I was elected mayor of my town. I was honored to be chosen to be the first alternate delegate to Girls Nation, and nobody broke a leg, so I didn't get to go. <laughs> but just to be the alternate delegate to Girls Nation was just um, an honor that I still get chilly bumps today when I think about it. Because remember, I'm a kid off the farm in feed sack dresses. So Kathy Black saw ability in me and she pulled me aside and began to talk to me about coming to OCW. Well, I never thought I would even get to go to college because my parents didn't have the money to send me. And I think because of her, she arranged for me to receive a scholarship. And that little scholarship was enough for me to pay my books and tuition, and then the, the school helped me find a 30-hour-a-week job at a business in downtown Chickasha, which was enough for me to pay for my board and room at the university. That's so, wonderful, and I'm going back to your mother's intuition. We say women's intuition that her daughter had something special. And kudos to your mother for instilling that leadership in your mind. And I just think that's lovely. So um, I went to school there for one year. And it was amazing because while there, I was an officer of the freshman class. class and then when it came time to try out for Glee Club accompanist. Now, the Glee Club at 
Oklahoma College for Women was very outstanding. There's, they're the ones who sang for the legislature the, the song Oklahoma from the musical Broadway show in an effort to get it approved to become the state song. So getting to be the accompanist for that glee club was a big deal. And I was chosen to be the accompanist had I stayed my sophomore year. But instead of staying, I made the decision to transfer to Oklahoma University. I felt that it might have a little more prestige in having a degree from there instead of a small school, a small women's college. However, <laughs> uh, the instruction I got at the small women's college was amazing because every professor I had had a Ph.D., that's wonderful. And we haven't touched on your music yet, but all through school, you were also a very accomplished pianist, a musician. Yes. And uh, I learned to play on a beat up old upright with sticking keys and pedals that didn't work. I had to ride my pony to my piano teacher's house a mile down the road it would always refuse to go over a bridge, so I walked halfway, leading the pony. My piano teacher would take me outside, put me back on my pony, because I was too small to get on by myself. I'd come to that bridge and have to lead that pony across the bridge. <laughs> Bless your <laughs> <laughs> But it worked anyway. <laughs> I learned to play reasonably well and had later on a very accomplished, two very accomplished teachers. But I couldn't major in piano and music at OU. Why? Because the practice rooms were closed in the old days at 10 o'clock, and I didn't get off work until 9.30. I couldn't afford to buy a piano. I tried to find an old one somebody would give me. I was unable to accomplish that goal, so I reluctantly gave up my dream of being a public school music teacher and majored in elementary education. Much to my surprise, in my very first interview for a job after graduation, I was interviewed by Lester Goldsboro, principal of Traub Elementary School in Midwest City, Oklahoma. At the end of the interview, he looked at me and said, would you be willing to become the music teacher at Traub Elementary and take on a fifth grade high achieving class for a portion of the day? Oh, my. I nearly fainted and fell out of my chair. And I said, how did you know I had musical ability? He said, every one of your references mentioned that. So I had the joy of my dream coming true in spite of my circumstances. And the lesson I learned from that was when God puts a dream in your DNA, it's going to come true, regardless of your circumstances, if it's truly in your DNA. I believe that's true. Absolutely. So keep telling your story. So you, you finally got to be a music teacher and, but you were having to stay one step ahead of this high achieving class for education. And I bet that kept you extremely busy. And I taught at Traub for two years. Then Richard accepted a position at Conoco Oil Company in Ponca City. And there I applied to teach, and they assigned me to teach um, sixth, fifth and sixth grade at McKinley School. 
And then I became pregnant with my second child, with Karen, and I stopped teaching public school, taught privately piano lessons, and then the music director of the music department in the Ponca City school system approached me and asked me if I would be willing to teach music at at um, Jefferson Elementary School. I said yes so fast, and I think Karen was four years old at the time, if I remember correctly. So I taught there a number of years, and it was a group of students on the other side of the tracks. They, most of them, not all of them, but most of them came from poverty families, families living in poverty. So I knew all about that. Yes. And I wouldn't give them an inch because they were poor, because I grew up that way, and I understood them better than they understood themselves. Absolutely. And I had high, high standards in my classroom. I met with every parent and explained to the parents I was going to expect a lot out of their children because I wanted those children of poverty to experience what it felt like to do something really well. You would not believe what happened. The high school students heard about our 4th, 5th, and 6th grade choir. They came to every concert we had. People from around the city came because we had established a reputation of having fabulous concerts. They couldn't believe these young children could sing in three-part harmony, could follow a director so well in crescendoing and singing softly and and, and putting personality into the music. So we had honors and got to do things that most grade school kids didn't ever get to do. And it was one of the most rewarding periods of my life. However, I had made up my mind when I was about eight or nine years old that when I grew up, I was not going to be in poverty. I was tired of shoes that had holes in them. I wanted store-bought clothes. <laughs> um, I really made a commitment to myself that I wanted to develop wealth when I grew up. And I discovered after three or four years of teaching that I would never, ever make more money than I needed because I wanted to make more than I needed so I could give it away. I'd never been able to buy a friend a birthday present. I'd never been able to buy my parents a Christmas present. If I gave presents, they were all homemade some way. And I really wanted that little bit more money than I needed so I could do these things that I dreamed about doing. So when Richard came home and encouraged me to get into the real estate business, I reluctantly agreed to try it. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad I did because it was the avenue the good Lord provided for me to develop wealth. And it wasn't easy at first, I remember. Oh, no. (laughs) I um, had no idea how to make the transition from being a teacher, a public school music teacher, into becoming a business person building a, a reputable business. 
I'd never had a business class in my life. And the first almost year, well, the first eight months, I accomplished nothing. I had no, li- I had very few listings and no sales. It was the hardest business to break into, uh, I felt, th- that I could have ever experienced. But some kind of miraculous things happened, and the the next six months, starting in September of that year, for the next six months, I sold 35 homes, which means if I'd done that well for a full year, I would have sold 70 homes. And I got my feet planted on the ground, and then I realized that what my real desire was was to help other people succeed. So we started a company after we moved to Edmond, Oklahoma. And that little company grew. I had two wonderful business partners, Ruth Honeycutt and Jerry Brown. These women were exceptional. And they listed and sold, and I played the role of the manager of this office. And, of course, they helped me recruit. But long story short, that little office in Edmond, Oklahoma, became the number three office out of 7,500 offices in the Century 21 franchise system in the U.S. and Canada. That's amazing. And I knew then I was functioning in my gifting. And uh, then I got my broker's license because, see, they one of them had to be the broker because I didn't even have a broker's license. And then um, we later sold our company to Merrill Lynch Realty when they opened a real estate division. And that's when I fell in love with an asset-based business because we made a 2,000-plus percent return on our money when we sold that to Merrill Lynch. It wasn't for sale. We were doing well. But they gave us so much money for our company, we couldn't believe it, and we thought we better take it. (laughs) (laughs) Then I set up my own real estate consulting company, and then Gary Keller, the founder of Keller Williams Realty, accidentally, no, it was really a God thing, but he accidentally found me. And that was the beginning of my wealth-building adventure. Now, wasn't there a significant time going on? Was it the oil bust or something? He found me when we were broke because the oil bust hit in the late 80s, and we were involved in in developing some properties, had some partners who were really the big guns in our partnership, but they lost all of their money when Penn Square Bank fell. And we were called upon, because we had signed the notes, what they called joint and severally, we had to pay their debt. We weren't in Penn Square Bank, but because we'd signed those notes for some money we had all borrowed to buy some land, to buy a bank, and various things, we had to pay their loans off. I remember you saying we were diversely invested in all the wrong things. So maybe it was your partners, not you you personally, but the partnership was diversely yes. invested in all the wrong things. Well, Is that correct? We, we got caught up 
in the greed of that period when everybody was investing in everything because it's called an oil boom, but I'd learned in my life that there was always also an oil bust. Right. (laughs) And it happened in the late 80s, and it was devastating to the Oklahoma economy. This is when I, when Gary found me, and when we talked about me developing a Keller Williams region, I told him, Gary, I don't have any money. We lost it all in the downturn of the economy. We almost went bankrupt, but didn't because my daddy taught me that no matter what, you pay your debts. And so we talked to the people we owed money to when we ran out paying everybody's debts. Would they hang with us? And I remember I had made a pledge to the Edmund Educational Foundation, and I'd paid half of it, but I still owed half and couldn't pay it. And I want you to know that at the end of 10 years, I paid that debt off. And the newspaper owner, Ed Livermore, wrote an article about us paying that off and how much he respected and admired that because most people who still owed the Educational Foundation just said we can't pay period. And this was a value I remember that you learned from your father going through that very destitute time that he always paid his debts no matter how how difficult it was. Well, he took jobs troweling cement, smoothing cement. That is one of the most back-breaking jobs in the world. And he was really, really good at it. So the three years in a row that he lost his wheat crop to tornadoes and hailstorms, he took troweling jobs. He had a reputation in the community around Enid that he was really good at that. He nearly lost his back doing it. But any year we didn't have enough money from our crop to make it. Guess what he would do? And this is absolutely something that you learned as a value that your father instilled in you as a young girl, always pay your debt. So here you are. He wouldn't let us take government assistance because even back then you could get free butter and free cheese. And my brother came home one day because he had learned at school you could get that. And he said, Dad, why don't we go get free cheese and free butter? And he said, we are not taking any government assistance. We are going to learn to pay our bills and pay our debts from our own initiative, not from getting help from the government. Besides, your mom makes the best cheese in the world, and she can, and you have been churning the butter for years. You'll keep churning. <laughs> That's it's it's so motivational and so inspiring. So here you are. Fast forward, you'd paid off all these debts after ten years um, that you had committed to for prof, uh, nonprofits and helped just as your father had instilled in you as a, using uh, Mr. Carnegie as an example. So here you are, you have nothing, you've paid off your debts, and Mr. Keller came to you and, and he, made this offer. Yes, he did. And I said, I want to open a region. I want to open Oklahoma as the Keller Williams region. And he said, Mo, I don't have a regional document yet. I don't have a franchise document. And I said, well, Oklahoma is a non-disclosure state, and all you have to do to let me open these offices in Oklahoma is give me a written letter and tell me that I may use your systems in Oklahoma. And then when you get a 
your franchise attorney and you get organized to become a franchise, we can do the document later. And he shook my hand. And as we went into business together on a handshake, and I said to him, now my daddy taught me that a handshake is more precious than a contract. Isn't that amazing? I was yes. 54 years old when I met Gary, and he was 34, so I was old enough to be his mother. He let me open Oklahoma with no money, with a letter approving that I could do the offices. And then several months later, he got the franchise document written, and then he allowed me to pay for the franchise as I brought offices on. So there was a tremendous amount of trust that you had developed between you and Mr. Keller. You were trusting him to go through with uh, completing the franchise. Yes. And he was trusting you that you were going to pay this, and this Correct. was all done on a handshake, no contract. Well, later we had right. a contract, but in the beginning we didn't. And I did so well in Oklahoma. Our people did so well that I believe it was three years later, yes, 92 to 95. In 1995, he asked me to come and be his CEO and, and be his business partner he actually gave me ownership in the national company. If I would move to Austin and be his partner, and um, when he asked me how much ownership I would have to have to make the move, I, I told him, and he said yes so fast that I know I should have asked for more. <laughs> Later, he, w he told me how much he was willing to give me, and I didn't ask for nearly that much. But let me tell you, the amount I did ask for that he did give me has blessed my life and my family's life and a lot in 43 charities and ministries beyond anything you can imagine. And your leadership has just blessed us all tremendously. And I still keep thinking about your parents and how that foundation that they laid just created a pathway and a vision for your life. It's See, a truly inspiring. The question it begs is, what are parents today saying to their young children about money, about the child? My daddy used to say to me, honey, you can be anything when you grow up if you'll just work hard enough. I wish he would have said, honey, you can be anything you want to be if you will work smart. Because <laughs> there's a big difference in working smart and working hard. Do you get my point? <laughs> I absolutely do. Work smarter, not harder. And I'm just thinking... If you don't, I don't mean to go down um, a rabbit trail, but I'm thinking about the work ethic that you instilled in those fifth graders in when you were teaching music. I'm, I'm just wondering, so many people will say, well, I have this teacher that really, you know, inspired Had me and motivated. high standards. Yes. And, and I told them I will not accept mediocrity. Right. I will only accept excellence. And that means we may have to sing a phrase over for 50 times before we get the sound that I want, before we get the excellence that you're capable of giving me. And we won't know, uh, probably, but I'm just wondering how amazing the amazing inspiration that was to some of those students and what they did because of that seed that you planted in their lives as a low-income child during that time, you know, in that time in their life. How wonderful was that? Well, so, I still hear from them. I bet. Let's pause for just a moment to hear from one of our great sponsors. 
Hello, this is Jay Zacharias with the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum, and I would like to tell you about one of our partner sponsors. His name is Justin Krieger, and he has worked as an independent insurance agent at Krieger Insurance Agency in his hometown of Hobart, Oklahoma, since 1999. Justin is honored to help with the annual Celebration of Freedom event and has been a board member for the General Tommy Franks Leadership Institute and Museum for many years. He is also a fifth-generation farmer and rancher in Kiowa County, where cattle, crops, and even insurance is sold with a handshake. Give him a call at 580-726-3076, or come by the office if you would like to speak with Justin Krieger or Kathy Lankford about insurance. We are thankful to our customers and friends who have supported us through the years. Again, Justin would like to say how honored he is to live in such a great country and how proud he is to help sponsor these podcasts. Please enjoy the rest of this podcast experience from your friends at Krieger Insurance Agency. Now let's get back to our episode. So I I didn't mean, like I said, to go down a rabbit trail, but so here you are and you are developing this franchise with Mr. Keller and you've created this leadership culture in your... Well, when he asked me if I would move and be his CEO and be his business partner, I said, be your CEO. I've never had a business class in my life. And I don't know how to be a CEO. And he said, yeah, I think you do know how because you were the CEO of the Oklahoma region. And it has flourished. So can you imagine by the time I, he asked me to be C- CEO, I was 57. I'm a woman. I've never had a business class. And he knew he wanted me to fill that position. I was helping him find a CEO. I brought some people to the table. And he said, no, I want you. And I went home and I said, Richard, I told Gary Keller no. He wants me to be his partner. And see, I I lacked confidence in that in being that when I hadn't had, I hadn't been a business major. And Richard said, I believe you can do it. And I think you should at least interview with him, at least walk through the open door he has provided you because very few women who are 57 years old get this opportunity. I love that Richard supported you and inspired you and encouraged you and he saw something in you too just like your mother did and your father did then I think I heard from one of our um, latest podcasts uh, John Otteson president of William Penn said you develop confidence through the process that's right and so I believe that you had some guiding principles and I'm just throwing this out there you had some guiding principles that were the core of your success in your initial endeavor in real estate that others saw in you that you brought to your leadership with Keller Williams can you share those guiding principles well I can as I think of them and number one is I had a work ethic that I would put up against anybody in the world I had chores to do when I was six years old I had to bring in the cattle the livestock from the pasture I had a cow I had to milk those little fingers could barely get it done but I had responsibility I didn't play a lot as a child because I was digging potatoes and I was cleaning vegetables and doing all the things that you have to do on a farm. And it's far more difficult for a parent to develop work ethic in a child in the city than it is if they live on a farm because the work on a farm never ends. Right. And so I went into the job determined 
to prove my value with my work ethic. Number two, I had been taught fiscal responsibility. I am so grateful I grew up in poverty. That is the greatest thing, one of the two greatest things that ever happened to me. Because when you grow up in poverty, you are you value your capital <laughs> and your capital may be a dollar but you're really careful how you spend it because you know it has to last you for a month <laughs> do you know what i yes I'm i saying? absolutely do and so i saw how much gary was putting into giving birth to this national company which became international later. And I knew that if he continued to do what he was doing, he, would, he wouldn't make it because he wasn't generating enough royalty from the franchisees. So the first thing I did as CEO was I raised the franchise amount. He had it at 4%. I raised it to 6% because I knew if we raised it to 6%, I predicted that we would be profitable in two years. So even though I couldn't read financials at the time, but let me tell you what, I learned to read them, uh, I, I was careful with his money. And being fiscally accountable is so important. And I wish I could go to Washington, D.C. and teach the president and all of the people in the Congress accounting 101. I've never had accounting 101, but I know I could teach it. I know you could, too. <laughs> and I'm so frustrated because they don't understand as they kick the can down the road and they don't pay off the national debt, how absolutely devastating that will be at some point in time. Now, enough of that. Yes. <laughs> uh, I would say the second or the third thing that was important is I believe that one of the most important things that leaders forget is the importance of, of developing and growing their faith because your faith is where you reach your values and your values are what cause you to make decisions and when you really know what you believe and I've just demonstrated to you by talking about the government yes, what I believe. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, when you really know what you believe, it makes very difficult sit decisions easier to make because you base those decisions on the values you have as an individual. And you don't get values unless you have a faith, whatever it is and you develop that faith, mine happens to be based on Christianity because I am a follower of Christ. So my values are based on biblical principles. Now, I learned how important those biblical principles were when I had my first real estate company because I wanted everything to be win-win or no deal. I wanted it win for the seller and win for the buyer. And it, if it, it couldn't be win-lose for me. I had to know it was good for both parties. Integrity, do the right thing, even when the right thing is very, very difficult to do. I, I knew that no no transaction was worth my reputation. That's a biblical principle. Absolutely. I knew trust begins with honesty. That's a biblical principle. Success through people 
is actually a a biblical principle. Jesus did it with 12, and we still talk about him. And it's been 2,000 years. Duh. (laughs) I believe that great leadership, the principles of great leadership are all biblically based. They are. And when they're not, the business gets into trouble. The agent gets into trouble. And you have to be careful when you recruit people to a, a, a... an important position in your organization or you recruit an agent that they are a match for you according to your principles. For example, one of the most important values that Keller Williams that we have in our company is it's God, it's God and family first and, and your business second. Well, when I used to go to Yale University to talk to the MBA students, they would say, doesn't that value statement hurt you? Doesn't that cause damage to your company? And I would say, I can't believe an Oklahoma farm girl is going to be able to teach you something because you're at Yale. I'm shocked but get your pencils and paper out and write this sucker down. That value statement is a magnet that attracts like-minded people. People, no matter what their faith is, if they put their faith first, their family second, and the business third, or I say it, your faith and your family first and the business second, We know they're a match. We aren't the same religion because we're a secular company. We're not the same color. We're not from the same country. We have different political views. We're different in every single way but that way. And see, when you have like-minded people who buy into the purpose or mission of your company... You have a power that causes you to be productive and to grow during a downturn, downturn in the economy. Because Stanford University couldn't figure out why we always grew when the market got bad (laughs) and everybody else went down. One of General Frank's core principles of leadership is caring, and we've, we've covered a lot of those principles in your discussion, but I know that you created, when you said it had to be win-win, it was a culture of caring, both for members of your team and for your customer. And can you share with us how you created that culture within your team. Well, because the higher purpose of business is to give, share, and care. And so if you operate on that principle, then naturally you're going to build a philanthropic model for your company. We built KW Cares. (laughs) I see. That's a good name for it. Yes. And if every church business, um, community uh, club or group had this philanthropic model, there would be no need for welfare. And what KW Cares does is everybody within the company gives to KW Cares. We teach the principle of tithing. And they tithe to KW Cares and their church or um a charity or whatever, and we get in about $5 million a year, and we use that money to help agents who have any kind of a tragedy or a horrible thing that happens in their family, from car wrecks to um, sickness, you name it, we're there to help them. So see... 
We have Red Day, which is one day during the year that we go out into the community and dedicate that day to the community, to our favorite ministries and charities. And so we've covered care, share. We share our time with our community and giving. The agents in our company give, you just can't believe, when when the cur- hurricanes hit, the tornadoes hit, the national tragedies hit, our people are there. We have trucks that go in who are already packed and loaded who go in. They're there within an hour of that storm being over. FEMA comes a month later. <laughs> We're there. And it's exciting to watch our people when they need help. It's just incredible. And I think it's so incredible. I keep going back to this, but if your father had only known, obviously he had great vision, but that day on the steps of the Carnegie Library, what he had created is absolutely astonishing. We are the largest real estate franchise company in the world. We do more production than any other real estate franchise company in the world. If you would have told me as a child that I would grow up someday and have a part in building uh, the largest franchise company in the world who has the most unique culture in the world, I would have told you you were crazy see god's plan for your life is a whole lot more exciting than your plan for your life (laughs) absolutely and i it's just every time i hear it every time i think of it and know your story i'm just astonished and amazed and i'm so impressed and i i just can't tell you enough See, we, so much. the way you build culture in a secular company is you have a foundational piece of the culture. And, of course, it's the mission statement. The mission statement in our company is because a mission statement describes the purpose of your company. Correct. It's to build careers worth having, businesses worth owning, lives worth living, experiences worth giving, and legacies worth leaving. Now, if we honestly do that, see, we have a class that teaches our people a life worth living. It's called Quantum Leap. And it's about all the disciplines of life, the spiritual disciplines, the money disciplines, the physical dis- disciplines, the time disciplines, on and on and on. And then we teach them about legacy. Like my husband is leaving one of the greatest legacies I've ever seen anybody leave because he bought a block of our little downtown that he grew up in. I lived out in the country. And he rebuilt everything because the buildings were falling down and they, the engineers said they could not be saved. They were too dangerous. And he rebuilt a block of that downtown. And I'm telling you, it looks like something from a Hallmark movie. That's wonderful. And then he built our family retreat in that little town. And now we use it with VRBO, Vacation Rental by Owner. And... What a legacy he's leaving. Well, see, I hope my legacy is that I help build a company who has a culture of caring for each other, having each other's backs, wanting their transactions to be win-win or no deal. Because, you see, if we do all these things, then... People, we will become a light in a dark business world. And our vision is that people will choose us. That's our vision. Well, I guess they are because we have nearly 190,000 people in our company. 
Is that not amazing? Did you ever dream no. when you shook hands with Mr. Keller that that Never. would happen? 190,000 When I was CEO, my dream was to build it to 50,000 because I started with 1,800. And sure enough, when I was totally exhausted, it was 10 years later, and we had built it to 50,000, and I dreamed of building it to 500 offices, and we actually built it to 530. Oh, that's wonderful. And then the CEOs who have worked hard after me, it's now a much, much larger. But... But I learned how to build culture in a company, in the, the one in the company that we sold to Merrill Lynch. So you have your mission statement, and then you have your acronym that uses the words that describe how you're going to treat each other, how you're going to treat your clients, how you're going to treat your family and your friends. Ours is win, win, or no deal. Integrity, do the right thing. Customers always come first. Communication, seek first to understand. Creativity before results. In other words, you want to brainstorm your ideas before you do them so that you can find the flaws in them. Yes, ma'am. And then communication. I've already said communication. The other one is commitment. In all things, if you commit to go to your child's soccer game, you go. If you commit to return phone calls in three hours, return phone calls in three hours. And then trust begins with honesty, teamwork. Together, everyone achieves more and success through people. Because no one achieves alone. No one ever achieves alone. So when you have your acronym, we call ours the Y, 4, C, 2, T's, then that's your foundational piece that you're going to build your culture for, off of because the people need to know what the predetermined way is that we're going to treat each other and our clients and customers. And then, of course, you build culture by telling the stories when you see these glorious things happen. Mo, were there any specific challenges that you would like to share with our listeners, uh, specific, really difficult things that you got through and how you got through it? Well, I actually have two. The first one is very interesting. I received a telephone call from a loan originator who was originating loans in one of our market centers. It was a market center that was highly profitable. She informed me that the owner of that market center was sending her pornography through our servers. Wow. Now, what do you do with that? I had my executive assistant call the owner of the market center and inform him he needed to fly into Austin on Thursday of the next week at 1 o'clock. He asked her why he needed to come, and she said, I don't know, but you better be here. He came at 1 o'clock. The first person who visited with him was our president. He put him in his office, had, his, had our tech people come in, and made him look at the pornography he had sent her. Our tech people explained how they knew it came from his computer through our servers because he was hooked up to our servers. After they finished making him watch the entire film that she sent me, they said, next you've got to go meet with Mo. He came to, into the conference room, sat down at the table across from me. 
I did not say hello. I did not say how was your flight in. I didn't say how's the weather where you're from. I looked at him and I said, we're not a match and we have two choices. One, we can fight this in court together or against each other, rather, or you can sell your market center in 30 days to someone that our president would approve. Those are your two choices. He looked at me with the most shocking response I could hope to imagine. He said, but Mo, you're a Christian. You have to forgive me. What would you say in a moment like that? It totally took me off guard. But I prayed for wisdom in that second, in that moment. Lord, give me wisdom. And the words came. And here's what I said. I said, I would forgive you if I heard a sincere, a really sincere apology. So he proceeded to give me a, quote, sincere, end quote, apology. And I looked at him in the eye and said, I assume you're sincere and I forgive you. Now you have two choices. We can fight this out in court or you can sell. You see, you don't sacrifice or compromise your standards just because you forgive someone. We weren't a match. If anybody thinks they're going to use our servers for pornography and I know about it, (laughs) I'm sorry, that isn't going to happen. Well, of course, he chose to sell the company to someone that our then president approved and he was out of the company within 30 days one of our most profitable offices forgiveness and accepting behavior are two separate things that's exactly right he thought forgiveness meant forgiving the problem and it not having any repercussions or consequences. That's a a wonderful story. Thank you for sharing that with us. And and I don't mean wonderful what happened. No. But there are difficulties that we face and how we approach them and deal with them are so important. And so many things catch us totally off guard and I'm sure that you were, and I, I appreciate you sharing that because that's a difficult story to share. You said there were two things. Did you have a second story? Yes. The second one, I was speaking to a group of young adults ages 20 to 40, and they had asked me to come and speak to their group about how I achieved at a high level. How did that happen? So they also asked me to tell my story. So I began with telling my story, much as I've done today, as you asked me to do, and then I told them that I believed the reason why I was able to accomplish quite a lot was because of the work ethic I had. And um, during the Q&A of that session, a young woman stood up and said, I disagree with you. I don't believe that you were successful because of your work ethic. I said, well, share with me why you think I was successful. She said, you were successful because of white privilege. I had never been told that before, ever. And talk about having a moment where I was speechless. I had no idea how to respond. 
And I ultimately said, after kind of going through a little process that is too long to share, I ultimately said, don't take away my work ethic because I'm white. The, cla the, the group erupted in applause and gave me a standing ovation. That is an outstanding story, and thank you so much for sharing that. And I think it's a very important story for us to understand today. I said to her, I'm sure you know your history, that you know all about the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. No one had privilege back then. I'm sure you understand that. And then I related it to the Whiz Kids program that we have in the area. And did you, do you agree? Do you, do you know about Whiz Kids? And she said, yes. Do you know about the young man that got a scholarship at Princeton? She said, I even know him. Did you know that the community came together and helped him get a wardrobe to go? Would you agree that he came from sheer poverty? Oh, yes, I would agree. Would you agree that people uh, assisted him and helped him? And she agreed that they had. And I said, nobody came to my rescue. I was as poor as he was, because I know him too. Nobody gave me clothes. I got a little bitty scholarship at a very small, wonderful college. So don't take away my work ethic because I'm white. Thank you for sharing that. That's absolutely outstanding and and I have seen that over the years seen that and it resonates with me uh, as my family also went through the Great Depression they were German immigrants and I know that they went through very difficult times and Understanding is so important. Understanding our history is so important and taking into account all of the history. I also told her that my parents didn't put the mattress on the top of their car and go to California, that they stayed here and faced the challenge. They didn't run away from it. We typically end our podcast by asking is there anything else you want to share with our listeners that one most important point and I feel like you have covered it I have to ask you but I feel like you have you're so good at this and so well um schooled and thought out on all the things that you believe in and it just comes easy for you to tell us because you have been over and over and over this and it's so ingrained or as cemented well, into the last your DNA. Thing, the last thing I would share is the golden rule. I have found it to be in almost every holy book. I haven't read all of the holy books, but I have several. And you simply do unto others what you would have others do unto you. And that includes once in a while of having a fierce conversation. It's not all goody-goody. <laughs> right. Sometimes for the betterment of the person that you're hoping to help succeed, you have to share with them a flaw that might be holding them back. And I call those fierce conversations. Simply treat everyone. I always expected Gary to tell me when I was making a mistake in his eyes because he's such a visionary genius. He was the very visionary genius. I was the implementer, and he would. He helped me grow, and it's easy if you treat people with kindness 
and love, and yet you share with them what they need to hear, not just what they want to hear. You know, I was just thinking that yours is certainly not a Cinderella story, but it is a great story in every sense of the word. Every sense of the word is a great story. And there's lots of other ways to describe it, but I don't know how else you could could describe it is it has everything. It has motivation. It has inspiration. It has discipline, accountability. All of the things, integrity, work ethic, character, all of those things. And I appreciate you so much in sharing this story with our listeners. And I know that and, and hope that and believe that many will benefit from this wonderful story. And thank you so much for well, sharing. It is my honor that you ask me. Thank you so much, Mo. Have a lovely day. Thank you again to REI Oklahoma for making this podcast possible. For nearly 40 years, the board, staff, patrons, and supporters of the nonprofit economic development REI Oklahoma are committed to expanding Oklahoma's economic prosperity, earning the reputation of being one of the most comprehensive economic development organizations in the country. Business loans, training workshops, business consulting, and networking opportunities, as well as technical assistance and even commercial business space are made available to Oklahoma entrepreneurs and small businesses. For low and moderate income individuals and families, down payment and or closing cost assistance is offered. Learn more at reiok.org. This has been the Four Star Leadership Podcast. Now it's your turn, Four Star listeners. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and let us know what you thought of this episode. Be sure to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and tune in next month for our next episode that airs every last Friday each month. Go be great.